Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking with Kathy Kelly, board president of World Beyond War, author, activist, uh, peace leader for many years. Uh, We're talking about upcoming uh, events and current events, including a 24-hour peace wave that's planned for this summer. Kathy Kelly, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Good to be back on Talk World Radio and talking about the world with the peace wave. Uh, Well, I'm going to be asking you about things that we're working on together, uh, many of them, but... uh, for people who don't know, what the heck is a peace wave? Mm, well, you know, Jeremy Corbyn was so encouraging uh, some months ago. He said, you know, yes, we're facing very, very critical times and the war makers always seem to get the upper hand, but we do have this unusual new technological capacity to really manifest the idea that we are many, they are few in terms of the maybe 1% of elites who want to continue uh, the reckless manufacture of more and more weapons and war. And so the peace wave was a, a good experiment undertaken, I think, at the leadership of the International Peace Bureau, but World Beyond War certainly hopped on board last year. And the idea is for 24 hours consecutively all around the planet, people are manifesting what they believe in, what they really want to see. And it takes all kinds of different forms and um, certainly plenty of room for song and dance, literally, for people that are in, you know, climate weather out demonstrating anyway, and then they can, you know, get some attention for their cause. Um, And, you know, there are some talking heads as well, um, but I thought that it was a very dynamic, lively presentation last year and and people can tune in whenever they want in a 24-hour cycle. Yeah, this will be the second uh, 24-hour peace wave if it's going to continue being an annual event. This is the second one and there is a website 24hourpeacewave.org numerals 24 uh, hourpeacewave.org or gets you to the very same place worldbeyondwar.org slash wave and people can see a video of highlights from last year, or they can watch the whole 24 hours from last year, uh, and they can propose uh, events, activities that could be part of it this summer, uh, or just sign up to watch. Uh, Or I think if people check back soon, we'll start posting where and when some of the events are that are planned so that if there's a, a rally or a demonstration or something happening near you, you can go and be part of that and be in the Peace Wave uh, live streaming for that, you know, when we're in that section of the world. Um, what are, and what David, are say the, the dates. What are the dates? We're talking about July 8th and 9th uh, from about 9 a.m. Eastern time until 9 a.m. Eastern time on July 8th to July 9th. Uh, This is, uh, you know, 24 hours uh, and going longitude by longitude around the world. Uh, So it's a different time depending where you are on Earth. But I know, Kathy, we've been in touch with various groups and individuals that are planning activities. Have you heard about any any creative ideas uh, or thought up any creative ideas that may be uh, showing up this year? Well, you know, the Red Cross recently changed its guidelines for accepting blood donors, and they're not discriminating against gay people as they had in the past. And so I, in a way, it's pulling an idea out of mothballs, I'll be honest. We did this in the 80s, but uh, Zul Zulkowitz in New York may be able to pull it off in 2023. The idea is to get a mobile blood unit and get commitments from at least 12 donors. But when the blood unit is parked, maybe in Union Square, for instance, in New York City, the donors would be flanked by banners that say specifically, give blood, don't shed blood. And the donors would have photos of places where bloodshed and terrible destruction has happened. And maybe the um, banners could also highlight some of the 
what we now call merchants of death. I think about Boeing and Lockheed and Raytheon and General Atomics. And, you know, how people know more about the history in this country when, um, you know, in 1935, there were 60,000 students who swore an oath and went on strike at campuses all across the United States, 1935, in April of 1935, saying, we will not get involved in another foreign war. World War I was such industrialized slaughter. There was tremendous opposition. And that was before the days of internet and cyberspace. And so imagine what we can do, turning yeah. people out to say, we want a future. These weapons don't defend us from pandemics or from the uh, ecological collapse we're facing. The, it's crunch time and we, we must manifest our resistance. Well, I love the give blood, don't shed blood idea and look forward to seeing the live footage of that from New York and from anywhere else that takes up that idea. Um, I also know there's some groups that are going to be painting large artworks and we're going to be checking in with them to see how their mural is shaping up during the course of the of the peace wave and others are doing concerts and rallies and demonstrations um, and I think it's it's encouraging to people uh, who maybe only have a small group or a hundred or low thousands of people at a rally to see that there's a rally happening at the same time in every time zone around the earth uh, and that we're one community. I, I mean, this is, this is the biggest advantage of this, I think. Do you agree? Well, I agree. And I think that we, we shouldn't allow ourselves to be represented by the very inhumane and I think reckless and cruel people who gathered at the G7. I mean, when that group of world leaders met, they had a chance by going to the commemorative site that would see Hiroshima for what it was as a devastated city of innocent people that were brutally slaughtered in introduction to the world of nuclear weapons. They had a chance and instead they they turned around and said, well, what we're really interested in is pursuing more warfare, more hegemony and control. And, and they welcomed Zelensky and they spurned the Pope and they spurned the Havaksha, as, as Pope Francis, I mean, who had been making pleas for peace. So I think we have to say that that doesn't represent us. That's not who we want to pay allegiance to. We won't salute that flag. There's no flag large enough to sh cover the shame of killing innocent people. As the late great Howard Zinn liked to say uh, yes. quite correctly. Um, I don't know if you saw Kathy, but we've added a report to the World Beyond War website from our chapter in Japan, uh, which did a bicycle tour for peace through Hiroshima City during the G7 uh, and got a fair amount of media and attention uh, with survivors of the atomic bombing of that city uh, demanding uh, that the G7 support peace rather than using the site of a nuclear disaster to promote more war, to, to advertise war as some sort of human service to be provided by the nations of the world, uh, which strikes me as absolutely disgusting. Well, that's certainly true. And it's a very critical time now to stand up to the war makers. I mean, people in Gaza have been suffering under yet another bombing and those um, Israeli defense slaughters of civilian people are using weapons manufactured by Boeing, um, by Raytheon, by Lockheed Martin. And then also the Saudis continue to blockade the ports around Yemen. The, the, the United States could be pressing for diplomacy. President Biden has uh, an opportunity to make good on what he promised he would do. Uh, 29 members of Congress have signed on to a letter. I, it may be more than that, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, there are plenty of petitions and numerous webinars and activities have been 
uh, campaigning for years for the United States to stop supporting the Saudi-led coalitions or the UAE uh, governance continuance of, of the suffering in Yemen. They continue to make people suffer in Yemen because they don't lift the blockade and they don't swear off uh, acquiring more weapons. It, it, it seems now that even Saudi Arabia is willing to negotiate peace uh, and the holdout is the U.S. government. Uh, I mean, that there are nations from around the world coming and helping negotiate peace. There's a, there's a great desire for peace on all sides uh, and it's the U.S. government saying no, which seems similar to the situation in Ukraine where you have governments from around the world, large and small, and officials, famous people like the Pope, saying, make peace in Ukraine. Here's a proposal. We can all help. And the proposals are all darn similar to each other because everybody knows what's needed. Uh, and it's principally the United States, uh, or in the case of Ukraine, maybe the United States and Russia, uh, saying no. Well, I think that we're perhaps looking at a time when uh, people can talk plausibly about an end to United States hegemony. Uh, I think the United States is feeling terrific competition with other countries that didn't invest all of their wealth and resource and ingenuity and potential in encircling the world with military bases and promoting military products. There are other ways to go about developing your economy and your relationships with other people. And, uh, you know, people used to think the sun would never set on the British Empire. Well, that sun has by and large set. And it may be that the United States is moving toward uh, a diminishment, a serious diminishment of its imperial capacity to force other countries to either subordinate themselves to our national interest or be horribly punished as civilians in Iraq were horribly punished, uh, as yeah. people in Afghanistan have been horribly punished. And so I don't think uh, empires go down easily. And there are lots of um, people who have made such enormous profit in promoting wars and don't want to see the Pentagon let up on that strategy. So uh, can we turn this around? It's such a dire question right now in the face of ecological collapse. So I think it is good for people to think about security. It is good for people to think about what terrifies them. It's just that what should be foremost in our thoughts about what terrifies us, I think should be the possibility that the planet won't survive our status quo. That should be terrifying. and. Um, but then not to be controlled by our fears, but rather to link arms with, you know, through cyberspace and in reality, other people who are kindred spirits who say, we, we can and we must turn this around. You can't expect that the babies in their cradles are going to do it, that they depend on us to act like adults and not be big children and dominated by, um, you know, small-minded, narrow-minded people who seem not to like to think. <laughs> Very good description. Uh, we're speaking with Kathy Kelly, uh, among many other accomplishments and titles. She is board president of World Beyond War, uh, where I am the executive director and we get to work together. Uh, I wonder if Winston Churchill had had a pocket full of nuclear weapons when the British Empire was on its last legs if we would still be here. Uh, I mean, so one question is how you end a US empire without nuclear apocalypse. Uh, and the other question is what do you replace it with? Um, because I don't think we need a Chinese empire or a balance of powers between uh, antagonistic uh, madmen in China, Russia, and the United States. We, we need international governance and cooperation if we're going to survive these other crises and disasters we're slowly creating. Uh, so how do we how do we get from here to there? Mm, well, I think it may sound tepid, but education, education, education. People have, I think, 
um, a, a need to know more about the realities that, that warfare is causing worldwide and also about what things have worked. I mean, I'm very happy that World Beyond War's upcoming conference is going to be telling the stories of times when nonviolence did make a difference. And that's that's not a small set of stories. There are loads and loads of situations where people didn't use weapons. They didn't even think about using weapons. And they were able to move through various great critical situations. I mean, even in Ukraine, in the beginning of the Russian invasion, there were people who were out in the 50s and the 100s saying to the Russians, we don't want you to come forward any further. Uh, and now I, I, I don't at all want to suggest that uh, somehow the Russians have turned around, but there was a point when negotiations could have been pushed forward when even um, you know the head of the Joint Chief of Staff, uh, Mark Milley, said that uh, prolonging the war in, for instance, he was speaking about World War I cost millions of lives and there was a point when there could have been negotiation. Well, I think that there has been that point and we shouldn't act as though, oh, there, there's no possibility for diplomacy. So, but that has, the people have to be educated about the ways and means of diplomacy. And often I think the old metaphor about the carrot and the stick makes sense. You try to devise carrots that people won't want to forego and 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 you you make a commitment to reparations you make a commitment to helping people to rebuild but if you only make a commitment to threat and force uh I, the united nations really becomes irrelevant yeah I, thank you for mentioning that we're planning an annual conference and an, an online line course uh, for later this year on unarmed civilian resistance. Um, and we've got a list now at worldbeyondwar.org slash list of just successful major unarmed resistance efforts to wars and coups and occupations. Uh, and that seems to be a list that no consumer of US media outlets has ever seen a single item off of. Uh, and we, we've just had peace groups pay significant money to publish sensible words about Ukraine for the first time in the New York Times in a full page ad and in the Hill newspaper uh, in Washington, D.C. in a full page ad. Uh, but without any reporting leading up or, uh, as far as I know, following the purchase of those ads, commenting on the radically different set of facts and information. Uh, the, the fact that peace has been possible, that nations around the world are proposing peace, uh, et cetera. So you can pay money and they'll take it and they'll put your ad in the paper, but they'll go on reporting as if it wasn't there. So this, this strikes me as uh, doubly unusual. Unusual to have a war with so many nations around the world proposing peace and to have the country, the countries responsible for the war, at least in the case of the US, have a communication system that's evolved to the point where nobody knows that. Nobody, it, go out on the street in the United States and ask somebody, is the US government doing everything possible for peace in Ukraine? And they'll say yes, right? Mm. Well, it, it is so interesting to see six African countries sending their diplomats and to see Brazil and uh, China and India uh, and Russia, the BRICS countries getting together and they're, they're going to be vetting the possibility of adding scores of new countries and uh, devising possible alternative currencies as well. So I think that uh, the times are changing and the New York Times is not doing a service to its readership if it doesn't pay a lot more attention to those realities. Uh, it's, it's uh, I think, a good time always to hear the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King about what's at stake for humanity. David, you just wrote about that. Were you with your son at the Riverside Church recently? 
one of my sons came with me to New York and we participated in peace events with uh, the crew of the Golden Rule, this little sailboat that half a century ago played a major role in ending uh, nuclear testing, except below ground. Uh, and, you know, which is sailing around the world and around the United States at the moment uh, with this message of nuclear abolition. And we went uh, and had an event uh, at Riverside Church and a walk. We walked to uh, Megan Rice's childhood home. We walked to Thomas Merton's uh, church. We walked to the different buildings in the area and the campus of Columbia University um, and stopped at significant spots and discussed peace. And, and what was, you know, so valuable about Dr. King's speech uh, that he gave at Riverside Church about a year and a half before I was born, uh, and perhaps discouraging, is that in my remarks on that day last week, I actually took a piece of Dr. King's speech and changed very few words, changed Vietnam to Ukraine. And the lessons about peace negotiations that existed but were denied, the, the, the White House pretended never happened, the, the strangeness of the liberators, <laughs> liberating people who didn't want to be liberated, uh, the, the, the madness of the militarism, the diversion of the funds into, I mean, it all, it all applies except perhaps for keep doing this and you will be approaching spiritual death. I think we <laughs> we passed that point some decades back, but it, it's such a, such a piece of wisdom uh, in one speech there. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, there are also people that want to call attention to the speech that John F. Kennedy made at American University. And Kennedy's a controversial figure, no doubt, as will be um, Robert Kennedy uh, running for president. But I think that in that speech, he recognized the nuclear threat. And um, we need leadership these days who can have that strength of you know, honest recognition. This is what we're facing. And instead, I think that uh, the G7 leaders uh, are, are so intent on preserving their own crumbling power structures that we, we, we do have to entertain the possibility that we won't survive. So I think the international treaty, the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons is something that still deserves our support and our attention. And in fact, at the International Peace Bureau's Peace in Ukraine Summit, which it will rightfully be very focused on Ukraine uh, June 10th and 11th, there, there's also going to be an effort to try to stop the drone, the weaponized drone uh, manufacturer and, and get a treaty to prohibit weaponized drones because that uh, new form of advancing warfare is actually combined with artificial intelligence could take away from human beings even you know, our capacity that we sort of have now to control things. We actually could lose that capacity. Absolutely, we could. Uh, and this is a, a summit you're mentioning that's happening in Vienna, Austria on June 10th with uh, representatives from around the world uh, and World Beyond Wars Education Director Phil Giddings will be participating. And it's a, a number of peace groups uh, planning it, and I hope uh, some significant efforts uh, for peace in Ukraine come out of that uh, summit. Um, there's a, there's long been a petition at banweaponizeddrones.org, uh, and there's a new website. Uh, is there not, Kathy, on banning weaponized drones, as well as one on merchants of death? Uh, well, um, bankillerdrones.org, and then also merchants of death org and uh, thanks to Greta Zaro, we've been able to put together uh, a website anticipating the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal in November of 2023. And we're just at the point of piecing together uh, the 30 minute episodes that focus in on the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, 
uh, Yen and Gaza, Somalia. So if anybody would like to help with that, we'd be very, very um, grateful for people with editing skills, graphics skills to climb aboard. And we're going to um, look forward to uh, successive presentations of the evidence and people can kind of have uh, gatherings, we hope diverse gatherings to watch this evidence together. We'd love to see people deliberately invite to their gathering people who are in the United States or in their own country anywhere in the world who've had to seek refuge, who've been displaced by these wars. So, you know, if you live in Buffalo, New York, you could invite Yemenis who live in Buffalo, New York, and Afghans and Iraqis and say, please come and watch this and discuss this with us, maybe provide some refreshments and use that as a way to further build our peace movement and you know, maybe make recommendations to the jurors who will be hearing about this. So you know, we recommend that you uh, have a general strike. <laughs> And if you live in Buffalo, New York, you can uh, investigate how wars and militarism fuel mass shootings uh, and bigotry uh, and the impact that has at home uh, and and vice versa, how such uh, hateful ideologies fuel more wars. Uh, we've been speaking with Kathy Kelly. She is board president of World Beyond War, which you can find at worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, we are growing. We're adding chapters. We're doing more and more events. Uh, we only hope it's fast enough. Uh, it, also, go and check out merchantsofdeath.org. Uh, uh, Kathy Kelly, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Well, thank you, David. I look forward to doing the Peace Wave with you as well. <laughs> I guess that's the Peace Wave. Thank you, Kathy. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.